Mike, I thought we'd begin with ADP, Automatic Data Processing, your mm-hmm. company. Can you talk just briefly about what the company does and IT's role in the organization? Sure. So if you know about ADP, which many people do, you probably know us as the world's largest payroll company. Uh, just to give you some uh, size and scale, we pay one in six people in the U.S., and that's about 33 million people. But we also pay one in 10 people worldwide. So clearly, from a payroll perspective, we're it. Um, however, what most people don't know is we're actually the largest human capital management company in the world. Um, we have a broad uh, suite of offerings, everything from HR, payroll, time and labor, benefits, all the way to some smaller areas such as screening selection services, so background checks, for example, uh, retirement services, so 401k plans. So really think about everything from, uh, that has to do with employment from cradle to grave, ADP handles. And then one other division we also have that many people are unaware of is a dealer services business. So if you bring your car in to uh, an auto dealer to be serviced, chances are the system behind that dealership is an ADP system. I wanted to get into your story specifically, Mike. What, mm-hmm. what is so interesting is you've taken kind of an, uh, a not-so-typical path to the CIO role. Mm-hmm. Uh, you do have a technology background uh, right. in terms of your education. You have a computer science degree. You also have an MBA. You spent time uh, in the early stages of your career in IT, but you actually grew up, so to speak, at ADP on the quote-unquote business side and ran where G- was, you were the GM of a business with an ADP right. and then became the first-ever corporate global CIO for the company. Can you talk a little bit about that journey and the advantages of the non-traditional path that you took to the CIO role? I started as a programmer, uh, got in, uh, broke my way into employment that way. Uh, but I quickly realized that uh, corporate life was, uh, there was much more to corporate life than being a programmer. And ADP has been very fortunate to me in not typecasting me as an IT person. So I was able to, to span out uh, moving from kind of product development, coding, all the way through ERP implementations, where I got interested in financial systems and sort of you know business applications. So started doing some ERP work, um, and then realized that uh, I needed to expand my my horizons if I really wanted to move ahead. Uh, to your point, I went back and got my MBA mm-hmm. um, at night. A company helped me pay for it, which was great. Uh, and then that opened up a lot more doors for me. So I rotated in through finance, uh, then uh, moved actually into human resources and did some HRIS work. Um, then my big break came when I was asked to run a business. So uh, about uh, 10 years ago, uh, our CEO approached me and asked me if I would be willing to take on a, a business role, which was really uh, a business that was heavy technology focused. So we thought it would be a good opportunity to get somebody with some technology in their background um, to be a general manager. Took on that business, which was our global HR payroll outsourcing business. And then that led to five years ago with the CEO coming back to me and saying, okay, now would you like to, to come be the CIO? And what was it about the CIO role, CIO role other than the fact that you had it in your blood and, mm. and had the uh, stories from somebody very close to you about the power of that role? What was it about the specifics of being the first ever uh, 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 occupant of that role within the company what, and, and leaving the GM position? Mm-hmm. What was attractive? Yeah, it's interesting. I was I was sort of done with IT, right? So I, I was I was running a PL, which is you know sort of the destination job for a lot of people. You think, okay, I'm in operations now, uh, I've made it, right? Now just work your way up the operations, change to bigger and bigger PLs. Uh, the the appeal for me was what you said, which is uh, we never had a CIO before, uh, so we were highly decentralized. Uh, product development and IT was really spread out uh, among our operating units, and our last uh, our prior CEO really had some vision and foresight to understand that the world was changing rapidly, you know, with the advent of, you know, more SaaS, more cloud, um, things were changing fast, and we needed more leverage across the business. So when he approached me and said, hey, Mike, thinking about naming a CIO, and I want to put together the R&D organization, some of the product development work, uh, traditional IT, which includes everything from kind of IT operations, data centers, networks, et cetera, as well as back office IT, you know, ERP, et cetera. That was uh, that was a role that was impossible to say no to uh, at a company like ADP. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. And I know that um, one of the early steps that you had to uh, had to lead was, in fact, centralizing mm-hmm. more of the organization clearly than it had ever been centralized before since right. the role had not been in place. How did you go about that? I know that's often a tough sell for organizations as you need to exert influence from mm-hmm. the center in a way that hadn't been the case in the past. Sure, sure. So first, um, we, we avoid the C word. We don't like uh, the word centralizing. Uh, <laughs> we use aligning. We like the, the word aligning. I think it is a more business-friendly uh-huh. uh, kind of Uh, I think two things really helped. First was, I think, absolutely coming from an operating job lent credibility uh, with the the business unit presidents who, in the end, had to decide that they were willing to part with 
the R and D functions and the and the IT functions um, into kind of a shared organization, right? That was not a trivial decision for them. Um, but the real the real way to, uh, that I went about it was just proving success, right? So the good news is it it wasn't a fight. There was no big debate. Um, it was a series of of small wins um, where we actually showed that we were getting leverage, that we could drive innovation. Um, that we could s- remain close to the business units and the markets, but still have one common organization where the BU presidents eventually said, you know what, I think you can actually do this better than I can. I want to focus on running my day-to-day operations and my strategy. Uh, you can go ahead and take this um, under your wing. Just please promise me you'll stay close to the markets. And um, as you know, we've done a lot of work to make sure we keep that alignment in- intact. Uh, Mike, as you went about the exercise of aligning the organization a little bit differently, what, what kind of org structure implications were, were there to that? I think, Peter, that's one of the big changes that we made, which has probably had proportionally the biggest impact on the organization. You know, when I took a look at the organization uh, as it existed when we kind of pulled everything together, um, we had a lot of layers, and that happens in IT. Uh, we got very often we, we coddle IT people as we as we move them into management positions, right? Like, oh, he's a good engineer, but we don't know if he's going to manage people, so we'll give him one or two direct reports, see how he does, and we'll you know he or she does, and we'll add more. Um, and then what you end up with is sort of the I formation in the organization in a lot of layers. <laughs> so what we quickly realized is there were just that's just too many layers between kind of me as, as the as a CIO and head of product development and the the first layer, which is really touching, you know, the code and the clients, um, 11. There was 11 layers in an organization, which was too much. So, you know, through we went through an exercise, kind of a delayering exercise, um, which really wasn't uh, as much about downsizing as it was about right-sizing the organization, and we really pushed that down. So by the time we were done, we went from 11 down to 6. I've also been intrigued to learn more about the way in which you think about social mm-hmm. um, and how you monitor social networks and mm-hmm. leverage them. Uh, to for insight, leverage them to as communications vehicles. Can you mm-hmm. talk a little bit about uh, uh, how you sort of your vision for social media as it applies to ADP? Sure. So I, I, I break that up into three categories, and you know, sort of internal and client facing. Internal, first and foremost, it's all about collaboration, uh, which is how do you create an environment, particularly in today's world, where you've got people who are telecommuting or home short, as we call them, people in multiple locations. So building that foundation is really important and with the, the technology today around social, you know, being able to collaborate, you know, blogs, wikis, uh, et cetera, um, you can really create a, a, a highly collaborative environment without necessarily having to put everybody in one place. When you get everybody in one place, it's great, but the reality is sometimes you have to transcend that. Um, so that's, that's one, and it's funny, I was talking to another CIO recently and he asked me, you know, well, how'd you do the business case on, on collaboration? I'm, I'm struggling, you know, I said, well, how do you do the business case on the phone you put on somebody's desk, right? I mean, it's, I think that conversation's over, right? You don't mm-hmm. need to do that. I think collaboration is the same thing. I think the tools are just the ante to play these days in, in, a, in an environment where you're trying to drive innovation. Um, really, the, the second part is, re- is really your brand. And this is where you know, marketing and sales and, and service come in. So we have a highly evolved ecosystem around using social to keep track of how we're doing in the marketplace today. So we monitor everything. We have tools in place that we use to track uh, customer sentiment, uh, to look for issues that are out in the marketplace, but also to drive sales leads, um, to look for prospective uh, businesses, etc. IT uh, plays a huge role in, in aligning with marketing and sales to make sure we've got that in place. And then the integration back to your ecosystem. So when you're doing service monitoring, for example, if a client has an issue, you want to be able to route that directly back to your service organization. So integration to CRM and things like that are really important. So that's the second layer. The last layer, uh, which is the most exciting to me, is really on the product side. So when you think about human capital management, you think about HR, and you think about the possibilities of of social and how it's really pervasive in today's world, um, building social into HR transactions is really critical. So think about the onboarding process, right? Um, You know, before you show up for work, you know, you can start getting plugged into the social networks of work. You can actually start interacting with people before you even show up day one when you get there, right? How do you learn about the company? Um, well, social channels are a great way to do that. Um, and then embedded in transactions, you know, benefits is a good example, right? What's the sentiment around a benefits provider when you're making elections around, you know, who you're going to use for benefits? Wouldn't it be great if you could tap into a social network? What's your experience been? So we're laying that into our, our products that we produce for our clients to, to 
makes uh, allow social to provide a better outcome. You are uh, part of a rising trend of what I've referred to as CIO pluses. Mm -hmm. You, not long ago, uh, were asked to take over product responsibility in addition right. to your, your responsibilities as CIO. Can you talk about the logic of that union and the value in having a single person responsible for both areas? Sure. I, I think, you know, at the end of the day, it's really about delivering outcomes and accountability. And I think the first big step we took at ADP was really erasing the seams between, you know, kind of IT internal and IT external, right? So, you know, client with a big C and client with a small C. Um, at the end of the day, we wanted one organizational that was accountable and no seams within that. Um, and it's worked really well to the, you know, and in a cloud business, having IT operations and product development work together is kind of a given, you know, that it's something you have to do. So then, you know, more recently under the same umbrella, which was, you know, how do we how do we flatten the organization? How do we how do we deliver outcomes and how do we build velocity? We said, you know, well, let's let's look at product management as this, this group that really helps determine market demand and client requirements and feed them into R and D and say, you know what, like why don't we just merge those two together, get faster, you know, more velocity through the system, um, eliminate a layer and just get everybody kind of in the same boat working together. And I was fortunate enough that our CEO had confidence in in me to say, you know what, that might be something that that you'd be good at leading, you know, in addition to your IT responsibilities. And it's early in, but already the organization is buzzing about the sort of the, the change in pace that we've been able to achieve by combining the organizations. So, so Mike, in light of your dual responsibilities that you were just referring to, um, how do you measure success? And, mm -hmm. and to what extent does your involvement now in product uh, influence the way in which mm -hmm. you gauge the success of your IT team? Or vice versa, for that matter. Right. No, good, great question. So, you know, I think when I first took the job, you know, we had all the traditional metrics in place, right? So, you know, uptime, you know, you know et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, they're great. And you got to have those. And, you know, they're the ante to play. Really, the trick is to figure out what business metrics, you know, the, the, you, your company has in place that IT influences and then figure out how you measure IT's impact on them. So I'll give you a great example. Um, sales productivity, right? So um, through lots of good work uh, with our, our sales leader, our sales productivity, which is the amount of dollars we need to spend in order to drive a certain amount of dollars of sales, has really improved over the last few years to the, to the tune of 20%. Uh, you, you could say, okay, that's great execution, but if you talk to our sales leader, he would say, no, it's because we have better products in our, in our bag. Of course, it's good execution as well. Salespeople always take credit for that, but um, it's also, um, you know, the products, do, do we have the hot products that make it easier for them to sell? And so what we've done is we have a, a governance process that we have with our sales organization where we actually measure the impact that the products we put out are having on sales. So that could be, you know, um, how many appointments it takes to close a deal. You know, that could be, um, you know, the, the amount of, um, uh, of uh, sales we get on a new product in a given launch period. Um, but we really keep track of those things. And that is how I then go course correct. Are we hitting the mark or not with product and, and R&D?